Hello and welcome to the fourth in our series of lectures on the Second World War. We had concluded the third lecture with an examination of the Anschluss, the German Anschluss with Austria, the Union with Austria in the spring of 1938, and then the evolving crisis over the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia in the fall of that same year. In this lecture, we will focus on the implications of the Munich Conference for Hitler's evaluation of the international situation. We'll examine his calculations about the Anglo-French responses to a possible invasion of Czechoslovakia and Stalin's assessment of the Western powers in the last months of the war. We'll also describe the impact of the Munich Conference on the German military conspiracy uh, against Hitler, which had been uh, gaining some momentum uh, in the, the prelude to the conference. And the lecture will conclude by tracing the evolution of the Polish crisis in the summer of 1939 and especially the stunning ramifications of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in August of that year. It's hard to talk about the Munich Conference or Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Uh, it, it simply, one thinks, if, if you want to discredit anyone politically at any time after 1938, all you have to do is say appeasement. If you want to suggest that a political opponent has sold out something, all you have to do is say Munich. Uh, and the two things come together as uh, an obvious condemnation of the myopic policies of Neville Chamberlain. Some would argue the criminally myopic policies of Chamberlain. But I think it's an important point to remember that in, in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the crisis in the fall of 1938, Neville Chamberlain was an international hero. Wildly popular in Britain for having saved the peace, a huge sigh of relief passed across uh, Europe that war had been averted, and Chamberlain enjoyed a brief period uh, of great acclaim. Uh, I'd like to come back and talk a bit about the actual conference itself. We saw in the previous lecture that at the last moment, as Hitler seemed intent on taking military action against the Czechoslovakian state, that Chamberlain, Mussolini, uh, and Deladier of France had agreed to meet with Hitler in late September, September 30th as it turned out, to see if war might indeed be forestalled. If one looks at the photographs of that conference uh, and the negotiations, it all happens in an afternoon into the evening, there is this photograph of Chamberlain, Deladier, uh, Hitler and Mussolini all extraordinarily pleased with himself, Goering, uh, the, the rotund, uh, second in command of the Third Reich, head of the German Air Force, head of the four-year plan, bouncing around in the background, all terrifically pleased with their work that afternoon. Um, notable by their absence in that photograph are two people. One is there is no representative of the Czechs at all. No Czechoslovakian representative was present at the actual discussions in Munich. The Czech delegation was standing outside the Führerbau, the uh, an administrative building for the Nazi party in Munich waiting to discover the fate of their country. There was another absence, miss, a, a person missing from those discussions in Munich, and that of course was any sort of representative of the Soviet Union. Stalin was not present. No representative of the Soviet government uh, had been a party to these negotiations. What drove Neville Chamberlain to, to undertake this policy? He, we've talked about the fact that Chamberlain was determined to, to appease. It's hard to say the word with that. It's just dripping with, with, uh, with judgment. But appeasement at this point meant not caving in, not some sort of craven, weak, uh, giving in to the National Socialist regime or to Hitler, but to make timely concessions on those points that could legitimately be granted to the Germans. It was a widespread feeling that Hitler might not have come to power had it not been for the vindictiveness of the Allies at the conclusion of the First World War. If one looks at Chamberlain's options in 1938, he was really determined to, av to avoid war, not at all costs, but the breakout of war would be a real defeat for him. He wanted he believed, certainly, that the United States was unreliable. The United States had retreated behind this veil of isolationism. Roosevelt would be reduced to being that of a, spe to a spectator. 
1938 and indeed into 1939 for reasons that we will certainly talk about. France, he believed, was weak. So what were the real options for British policy? The British Army was virtually non-existent in 1938. The Navy certainly was strong. The British had been uh, funneling a great deal of resources into the construction of an air force. But the British Army was certainly in no position to undertake military operations on the continent. And France seemed not to be terribly inclined to do it. Chamberlain, therefore, undertook this mission to Munich in an effort to save the peace. He had learned the lessons of the Great War, he believed. And this, is, uh, this was a view that he shared with a great many other people in Europe, pundits, diplomats, politicians, as well as the proverbial man in the street. If only the leaders of Europe in that fateful summer of 1914 had been willing to walk the last mile, to leave, to leave no leaf unturned, or whatever image one wants to use in that regard, to preserve the peace, then maybe Europe would not have slithered into the morass of war in the summer of 1914. So for Chamberlain, this going to, going to Germany, first when Chamberlain flew to Germany to meet Hitler in Munich, he was treated to the same treatment as Schuschnigg, that is taken up to the, up to the uh, eagle's nest, the German general staff was not present, so it wasn't quite the browbeating that, uh, that uh, Schuschnigg had received. Indeed, in his first encounter with Hitler, Hitler was, as he could frequently be when he wanted to, he turned on the charm. He was, he was sweetness and light itself, agreeable, ready to compromise, and so on. Chamberlain left that meeting believing that this was a man, certainly someone not to his taste, but a man that one with whom one could deal. So... He flew, he took his first airplane trip, goes to Germany, uh, begins the process of negotiation, returns back to Britain, negotiates with the French, brings the British cabinet into line so that everyone is in agreement. They will back this, this a, a sort of agreement that uh, Germany would ultimately basically receive the Sudetenland. Uh, he hoped that there would be some sort of plebiscite held in the future to, to ratify that decision. But he was convinced that these were the sorts of necessary steps. And he also believed that he didn't have very many options. It was important, it was absolutely essential to maintain the peace. Britain would be a loser, Chamberlain believed, by any sort of new outbreak of war. Even if Britain should win the war, if Britain had, become, had gone from being a creditor nation to a debtor nation between 1914 and 1918, another major conflict would really put Britain and the British Empire on the skids, uh, make Britain a second-class citizen, as we talked about previously, to the United States. And then there is the other, having said all of this, trying to give the rationale for Chamberlain's thinking, it is also apparent that he came away from his first encounter with Hitler, and even a second one. He went back to Godesberg um, before the Munich conference to try to, to, to negotiate a second time with Hitler. He actually seems to have trusted Hitler. He believed that he, 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 he came away thinking, well, this is, here's a man, I understand him, he's a nationalist, uh, he's conservative, he's, uh, he's someone with whom we can, we can deal. And if only Britain, France, and the other victorious allies had treated Germany in a more um, equitable way after the First War, then uh, maybe we wouldn't be in this position at the present time. We all know from the newsreels uh, the performance of Chamberlain upon his return uh, to Britain the standing out beside the wing of the aircraft uh, on that landing field holding up, it's actually not the Munich Agreement, but uh, uh, an auxiliary, an annex to that agreement in which Germany and Great Britain promised not to go to war with one another, not to use force in, in settling, it's, it's holding up that sheet of paper saying, I believe this means peace in our time. I think that probably stands at the top of the list for famous last words um, in Western history. Again, it's extremely important to remember that Neville Chamberlain at that moment was probably the most popular man in Europe. He was seen as a real hero. The troublemakers, the warmongers, Churchill, for example, and others in the British government, in the parliament, uh, other pundits who were saying, 
no good will come of this. One can't make a deal with Hitler with this National Socialist regime. These men were largely isolated. Their voices could be heard. But in general, the, the popular view was these people are troublemakers, they're warmongers, there is really a chance to save the peace, and Neville Chamberlain has been, made her, a, an heroic attempt to do just that. Chamberlain came back, indeed believing, that the basis for peace in his time had been achieved. Adolf Hitler drew rather different conclusions from his encounter with Chamberlain, Deladier, uh, and company at Munich. He drew the conclusion that the West was weak, that it would not fight, that push, if when push came to shove, Britain would not intervene on the continent to undo German actions. He would later say, uh, I, I, I know how they will respond. I've met them, uh, our opponents, I met them at Munich, they're worms. Interestingly enough, someone else drew a similar conclusion to the Munich conference, and that person was Joseph Stalin. Watching events from Moscow in isolation, Stalin was furious. Furious that the Soviet Union had not been included all the way through the crisis, the run-up to the Munich agreement, the Munich conference. The Soviet Union hammered away in all of its public statements we stand prepared to come to the aid of the Czechoslovakian state. We will honor our obligations to Czechoslovakia according to our treaty. But of course, if you'll recall, the, the, uh, the French would have to do so first. And the French sh showed no inclination to do that. As a consequence, Stalin believed that all Chamberlain wanted all he was interested in, indeed all that the West was interested in, was funneling German aggression to the East, to give, to point the Germans in the direction of the Soviet Union. Behind the scenes, there was also another reaction, and an extremely important one. The relationship between the National Socialist Party, this new Nazi regime, and the German army was a problematic one from the beginning. German military men were certainly very happy about Hitler's determination to restore the German army, to rebuild the German military machine, to restore German power and influence in the world. They had been very nervous, very worried in 1933-34 about the SA, the stormtroopers. In 1933-34, with the German army uh, limited to 100,000 troops, the SA had between 400 and 500,000 men at its disposal. The German army was leaders of the German army, even those that were quite pro-Nazi, were worried that Hitler, when push came to shove, would side with the SA, that the SA would simply absorb the army, uh, and that the old traditions of the German, Prusso-German army would be lost to this radical National Socialist group. So, and then, of course, in 1934, the army swears allegiance. Why does it swear allegiance to Hitler? Because in 1934, Hitler had purged the SA executed its leader, he seemed to have made peace with the army and to have said, given the choice now, what I need is the army, not the SA, even though the SA had been so instrumental in his rise to power and his, and his consolidation of power in 33-34. All the way through the dramatic events that we've been describing, Hitler's revision of the treaty, the German army, rather than encouraging Hitler, had acted as a restraint, had constantly said, well, are we really up to this? In 1936, as you'll recall, they had been uh, nervous about, indeed opposed, the remilitarization of the Rhineland, fearing any sort of French reaction would lead to an ignominious defeat on the part of Germany. They were, tried to convince Hitler in 1938 that, that the army was not even prepared to move unopposed into Austria. And, in 19, and as the Czech crisis began to develop, there was real concern in the army. The Czechs were well armed, well trained, they had good defensive positions, and within the high command of the army, the voices were raised quite secretly, of course, to say, if we are given the order, if Hitler sends us on a suicidal mission to attack Czechoslovakia, 
then I think the time has come to put him under house arrest, to depose him, uh, and to create uh, a different sort of state. General Ludwig Beck was one of the leaders of this conspiracy. Discussions had taken place as the crisis mounted. And then, of course, comes Munich. The German army, the leaders of this conspiracy, were absolutely flummoxed by this. They didn't believe that the West would cave in. Here they had been once again arguing, no, 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 this is suicidal, we can't do it, this will lead to disaster, and once again, Hitler had been proved correct. At the critical moment, they weren't going to have to fight for the Sudetenland, the West had caved in. With that, with this uh, Munich conference, this conspiracy, military conspiracy against Hitler began to dissolve. We'll see it resurface again. It would be many of the very same people in the summer of 1944, on July 20th, 1944, who would attempt to assassinate Hitler and to overthrow the National Socialist regime. But in 1938, the calling of the Munich Conference, Hitler's success at Munich, undercut this emerging military conspiracy against his regime. At the end of this crisis, Hitler now felt that the horizon was open to him. In March of 1939, Hitler used ethnic conflicts between Czechs and Slovaks as a pretext to send German troops into what was left of Czechoslovakia. Robbed of the Sudetenland and the mountainous regions that guarded the entry into Czechoslovakia, there was very little that the Czech army now felt that it could do to defend itself against the Germans. German troops marched in in the spring of 1939 Mar on March 15th. And now with that invasion, although Hitler tried to dress it up saying, we're going in just to maintain order. The Czechoslovakian state was an illegitimate state. It was inherently unstable. And with ethnic violence there, we're going to step in simply to preserve order. He sent troops in in March of 1939. And this invasion of Czechoslovakia was unopposed. German troops marched in unopposed. This is the real turning point for the West. Whereas the Anschluss could be with Austria could be justified on the basis of national self-determination of peoples. The Sudeten crisis could be in some ways justified that way. Uh, one could talk about just demands on the part of the Germans. One could talk about legitimate compromise, but not this invasion of Czechoslovakia. The move into the, this rump Czechoslovakian state in March of 1939 was pure naked aggression, and that's the way it was perceived. Everyone knew it. It marks also, I might say, a major turning point in public opinion in Great Britain. Now those voices in the wilderness, people like Ch Churchill, who had been arguing that, it was, that Hitler was inherently untrustworthy, uh, that one couldn't deal with him, now took on greater credibility. And Chamberlain's policy seemed to be, um, if not discredited, it was certainly in deep trouble. At this point, Great Britain extended a guarantee to Poland. And France joined with the English in this guarantee. In March, also in March of 1939, the Germans seized Mamel, this territory along the Baltic, which had been lost to Germany as a result of the Treaty of Versailles uh, to Lithuania. So Czechoslovakia, now Mamel, the Germans were moving over into a new phase of their foreign policy. The veil had dropped. Although Hitler continued to make the usual sorts of, of introductions to his policies about just, uh, justice for Germany, equal equality, and so on, uh, this was a tune that had now uh, had been played once too often. The extension of a guarantee to Poland by Great Britain was a startling reversal of British policy. But it didn't mean that Chamberlain had given completely up on the policy of appeasement. Chamberlain hangs on to this, to the, literally to the very last moment. Because in some ways for Chamberlain, even when the evidence began to come in that this policy had been misguided, there were too many chips on the table for him.
any war now was going to be a complete repudiation of all of his policies, all of the assumptions that he based his foreign policy on. He was so invested in this that he would continue, as we will see, to try to find some way to maintain the peace. The key to peace in Europe in the summer of 1939, however, was not in London, nor was it in Paris, nor it certainly wasn't in Washington across the ocean. It was in Moscow. The guarantees to Poland, the Franco-British guarantees to Poland, could only be effective. Chamberlain understood this. De Ladier understood this. Could only be effective within the context of some sort of overall collective security structure, one which had eluded them really since 1919. And that included in that collective security structure had to be the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was really, now there was the sense that, well, Poland is now going to be moved to the front burner of Nazi policy. So the Soviets have to be enlisted in this. The Soviets have to join in order to create a credible counterweight to the Germans in the East. Knowing this, as every policymaker, every newspaper reader in Europe understood in the summer of 1939, the British and French governments proceed in the most casual sort of way. They don't, they're supposed to send off representatives to talk to the Soviet Union. How do they do it? Do they fly them out to Moscow? No, they send them on a ship across uh, the Baltic Sea in this kind of leisurely, uh, almost Scandinavian tour arrangement. This didn't impress the Soviets very much at all. There was a sense, I think, on the part of certainly the Chamberlain government, that time was on their side. They didn't believe, the Chamberlain just absolutely, and one can understand why I would think this, thought it inconceivable that Stalin and Hitler could ever come to any sort of arrangement. Stalin had to know, didn't he, that, he, that Hitler was his sworn enemy, that the, much of, of Nazi foreign policy was based on the destruction of the Soviet Union, the anti-communist propaganda of the National Socialist regime. It was obvious, so as Chamberlain is reputed to have said, the Bolshevs and the Nazis will never be able to make a deal. Um, in addition, Chamberlain and the policy-making circles in Great Britain at this point were very mistrustful of the communist regime. Uh, there's no way around this. Stalin was certainly mistrustful of them. They didn't trust his intentions. And so there was no real community of interest here. Certainly the threat of the Germans, of the Nazis, um, but, but no real community of, of, of interest here, of, of trust. Also, th there's another factor here that I think should be brought out. We'll talk about this again when we talk about the German calculations for an invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. The Red Army in the summer of 1939 was the largest army in Europe by a long shot. But its status internationally was very low. In 1938, Stalin had begun a massive purge of the Red Army. We'll talk about this, as I said, in more detail a bit down the road. But we're not talking about just a purge at the very top levels of the Red Army. We're talking about a purge that goes all the way through the, the command down to company level. Thousands of Soviet officers and uh, NCOs were purged in the course of 1938. There was a general sense in the West that the Soviet Union was weak that it was this huge, a huge army certainly, but one that was riddled with uh, uh, political corruption, uh, with this ideological sort of, of action on the part of Stalin, and that the purges simply had, had, had torn out the heart and soul of the Red Army. Meanwhile, the Poles found themselves in an incredibly difficult position. The Germans, between the end, between the Munich Pact and uh, the fall of 1939, had tendered a series of offers to the Poles, asking them to join in uh, the anti common turn pact aimed at the Soviet Union. The Poles, over and over again, reiterated their willingness to discuss a revision of the Treaty of Versailles. They would talk about Danzig. They would talk about the Polish corridor. Nothing would be off the table. They were willing to compromise on these sort of territorial issues with the Germans. 
But the Poles absolutely refused to be reduced to the status of a puppet state. They didn't want to become simply a puppet of the Nazis, and they also didn't want Soviet troops on Polish territory. The Germans made a number of offers to Poland in October of 1938, in January of 1939, in April of 1939, in the aftermath of the, the British and French guarantee. In each instance, the Germans saying, we can cooperate, we can do things. The Poles chose not to buy this offer. Poland refused each of these overtures, and with the last refusal, the Poles set the stage for the conflict. There was a growing sense in Europe as the last days of summer arrived that a real crisis was imminent. And then in late August, the thunderbolt that sent shock waves throughout the diplomatic community. On August 23, 1939, the Germans and the Soviets announced that they had signed a non-aggression pact. In fact, the Germans had begun talks with the Russians in May of 1939, economic talks with them, and instead of putting this on uh, the more casual route that the British and the French had done, the Germans made a great deal of this. Uh, they sent high-ranking officials off to the Soviet Union. The, they emphasized the importance of these talks. And so they were taken seriously. On the one hand, the, what came to be known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Molotov was the Soviet foreign minister, had replaced Litvinov. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact made no ideological sense whatsoever. Here were these two sworn ideological enemies of one another. They had spent most of their propaganda lives attacking one another. But in the context of international politics in the summer of 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact made a great deal of sense. For Hitler, a pact with the Soviet Union in the summer of 1939 ended the prospect of a two-front war. Hitler was determined by this point to attack Poland. He was not going to be denied his war. As he said at one point during this, in August, I was cheated out of that war at Munich. Not again. He was determined. He was going to take what he wanted in Poland. He believed that the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact would have a deterrent effect. That is, he counted on the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact to, to restrain the British. The French he was not worried about. The French would do what the British wanted to do. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the, Soviet, the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, would, he believed, deter Britain from honoring its obligation to Poland. For Stalin, whose intelligence people certainly knew all there was to know about Hitler's large ideological intentions. They'd been able to read Mein Kampf, listen to the speeches, followed Nazi foreign policy. For Stalin, of course, the war, the, this agreement made very little sense in an ideological way either. But again, within the context of the circumstances of 1939, it was extremely important. For one thing, it would allow Stalin to buy time if the Germans were determined to attack in the East, and if the West was unreliable, would not come to his aid, then at least some sort of agreement with Hitler would allow him to buy time, to rebuild the Red Army, to, to reduce the effects of the purges. And not, there were secret annexes to this non-aggression pact. The Soviet Union and Nazi Germany had divided Eastern Europe into spheres of influences. They agreed it was clear the Germans were going to attack Poland in the immediate future, and they agreed that the Soviets would move in to the eastern part of Poland, that there would be a partition of Poland. Germany was to get Lithuania and Vilna. Russia was to get Latvia, Estonia, and Finland. Both sides had interest in Romania and its oil fields. They couldn't come to any agreement about this. This didn't bode well for the long run. But for Stalin, what these secret clauses did was to secure territorial and strategic advantages for the Soviet Union and Poland. Now, if the Germans were to attack, the Soviet border had been now moved hundreds of miles west. An attack against Poland, an attack against the Soviet Union, would now encounter Soviet troops in Poland. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact made war in Europe inevitable. 
Hitler, as we said, counted on the pact to deter Britain and France from intervening. He did not believe Great Britain would honor its guarantee. He expected Mussolini to sign on. In May of 1939, Hitler and Mussolini had signed what was called the Pact of Steel, in which they both pledged full assistance to each other in the event of war, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation. But in the last days before Hitler's planned attack on Poland, when he informed Mussolini, there had been no coordination of policy between the two, it was an alliance largely in name only, when he informed Mussolini of his plans at the last moment, he was astonished when the Duce told him that Italy would not be able to help him out uh, in the event of war, that in fact Italy was not prepared, would not be prepared for war until 1943. Hitler proceeded without him. Hitler, and this is an extremely important point, did not anticipate or intend a war with the West in the fall of 1939. Germany was not prepared for a war, a big war, in the fall of 1939. It had not made the economic preparations for a war, uh, an extended or a protracted conflict in 1939. The four-year plan had fallen far short of its goals. Germany was hardly economically independent. And when German troops marched into Poland, Hitler was convinced that Britain would see the light and that some sort of agreement would be made with Chamberlain. In fact, Chamberlain reluctantly issued an ultimatum that Germany had to withdraw from Poland and then they would talk. Hitler let that deadline lapse, and when it did, Europe was at war. We will take up the strategy employed by the Germans in September of 1939, the responses of the Allies uh, in our next lecture.